And Brother Danny, I want to pray with you as you do that. Would you come? And we will pray with you, my brother. Father in heaven, it's a real honor to have your word open to us this morning. And as our pastor friend shares with us, your open book, may the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Give him freedom as he speaks to us. May your Holy Spirit deal with our hearts as he deems appropriate in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much for that prayer. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, we are, it may sound like a cliche, but we're very happy to be here. We're, we're, we're very looking forward to uh, this past uh, two Sabbath, this, this past Sabbath and today. Uh, we definitely enjoyed uh, the Hammond Church. We really feel uh, welcomed and embraced and, and, uh, and it's been the same here. Um, and just to see this, the, the little kids and uh, see how the school has been, is a center, is part of uh, the life of this church is really, it's really nice to see that. Um, and I praise God that you are able to have that here. Um, it was kind of interesting to notice uh, last week, people knew exactly who Amy and I were. They had seen our picture, I guess, uh, and uh, they even uh, some of the young people there uh, they knew they knew our faces, very familiar. And uh, I suspect that as I looked up the the Hammond Church and the Northwest Church's website, you probably maybe you looked us up on social media. Did you? <laughs> probably, probably you did, probably you didn't, and, and you didn't find us. Uh, we're not there uh, as of this, this moment. At some point, we probably will get back to it, but um, not recently. And social media is really interesting. Social media can be a very powerful tool uh, to get in touch with people. It can be a very powerful tool to even communicate a message and to even market a little bit of our message and put it out there a little bit. And, but social media can be, we have already experienced, it, has, it could be harmful as well. It could be detrimental even for self-esteem. And uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Not long ago, I had a conversation, Amy and I had a, a conversation with a, um, uh, with a friend of mine uh, girl, and uh, she was around 24, 25 years old, and uh, we were talking, I think, about diet, or about exercise, or, or something like that, and one of the things she said was, you know, I just, I, I, I wish I could just eat all the carbs that I could, and eat all the sugar and the sweets that I could, and nothing would happen to my body. Oh, how I wish I could do that. You know, I, I have this friend back from high school. She posts pictures on Facebook all the time and how she's like eating these cakes and these sweets and these desserts and cheesecakes and everything. And she looks amazing. Every time I, uh, she posts a picture, she looks great. And she's always traveling the world. And, and, and oh, it is kind of... Uh, uh. It wasn't that she was happy for her, as you can tell. She wasn't happy for her. She felt a little bit envious. And that can happen uh, when uh, Facebook or Twitter becomes sort of like the, um, the world that you kind of uh, live in and it's kind of your reference. And um, that same feeling uh, happened happens to all of us in different ways, and it happens to some people in the, um, in the Bible. And just before I, 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 we open our scripture for today, um, I want to uh, introduce my wife. Uh, I, I honestly 
could not be standing here if it weren't for her. Um, and uh, I want to introduce to you my wife, Amy, if you would, wouldn't mind standing. <laughs> thank you. I'm putting her on the spot. Uh, thank you, babe. Um, as we were just thinking, I, I've, I've, we've never, I, I personally have never been interviewed for a pastoring position. You just are told by your president, go there, this is it, and pastor says, and church says, okay, this is our pastor, amen, sure. He's, he's younger than my son, but sure, you know. And we shall do God's work together. Uh, and, and I, but I really, uh, don't get me wrong, I really appreciate this process. I think it's very healthy for the church. And as a, as, as, as a member of the Adventist church, I feel that it, it is so awesome that the congregation has a voice and a, and a vote in, in, and a saying in this. And I don't, um, I really appreciate this. And so as I was uh, talking to her, we, um, uh, we were thinking um, about what to uh, um, you know, oh, and she was like, why did they ask me, uh, you know, how do you want to uh, help in church and whatnot? And, and it's like, what should I say? And, uh, and as we were discussing that, that, that possible question that I'm sure some of you might ask, uh, she said, I think my first, the first thing I need to do as a pastor's wife and my first duty as a pastor's wife is to support my husband. I, if Pastor Penn, you, you, you know, you're, you're a pastor, you know what that's like. And, and what a blessing and, and how happy I, I was the moment she said that. Uh, that is, that is, that is a, I, I'm really, really blessed to have my wife with me. And I pastored as a single pastor and, uh, and uh, it, is, it is a blessing. Uh, to have uh, a companion with you. Please turn with me to the uh, amazing book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. In the Old Testament, and I, I while I appreciate the, uh, the screen, I want you to just grab the Bible, the Pew Bible, or whatever Bible you have, if you brought a Bible, if you brought your phone, whatever, um, Take it out, and, and because we're not going to, I'm going to rush you through different scriptures or anything. We're going to stay in the book of Habakkuk. I like expository preaching, and I, I, I invite you to stay in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter, um, we're going to have a brief overview of the book, and um, we'll stay on chapter 2. So the book of Habakkuk, um, it is, as most of the minor prophets are sort of, forgotten books, books that not a lot of people talk about. And if, and if some do, they might just pick a, ver a little verse, a little phrase from here and there. Uh, and and it's, it's, I, I enjoy uh, the teaching of Scripture when you can just dig in there and, and, and not, you know, bring two, three Scriptures together and make up your own topic. And I like seeing the, the book as a whole and putting myself on Habakkuk's shoes and his, his experience with God, and I, I, I want to do that this morning. So Habakkuk, it is a fascinating book because Habakkuk is, is someone just like you and me. The majority of the prophets, they usually come with a phrase that says, thus saith the Lord. You know, and, and, and if, if you can just close your eyes and imagine, you know, uh, um, Ezekiel or Isaiah or, or some of those uh, prophets, you might think of them as people kind of serious and sort of a little bit, you know, and they're not coming with a smile, hi, you know, Jesus loves you kind of people. They're coming serious and it, thus saith the Lord, I will bring destruction and prepare you ungodly and the wicked shall be destroyed and... You know, you priest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But and so usually they come with a sense of this is what the Lord says. People, listen. Instead, Habakkuk comes with a different approach. The book of Habakkuk seems like it's it's like a diary. It's like uh, like a journal uh, that 
I guess it became scripture. And at the end, he wrote a poem and it became a hymn. And Habakkuk is, is his joy, his experience with God, his wrestling with God. And instead of God with a thus, thus saith the Lord, he says, he addresses the struggles of a human being, of a believer, just like you and I. He addresses God with the complaints and the doubts and the struggles that you and I face every day. Especially you and I who are Christians, who once believed, who have tasted the grace of God, who have been with Jesus, who have come, who have gone to the garden alone and have prayed and, and sensed the presence of God to you who have been baptized, who know that your sins have been forgiven. And Habakkuk is a prophet. We don't, we don't, all it appears is just the title of his name in the beginning of the book. And he, he the time when he wrote was during the times of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, we studied Jeremiah. We know that Jeremiah was lived around 605 B.C., uh, this is right before the exile. When is, when is the exile? For those of you who are not very familiar with the history of the Bible, you know uh, Moses, right? Uh, and a Abraham, he got the promise, you know. Then, uh, you know, his children went into Egypt for about 400 years. They were delivered. They went into the desert. Then they went into the promised land, okay? After that, they were ruled by the judges, later by the kings, King David, Saul, Solomon, etc. And then they, uh, they had corrupt kings. And, and, and this is when we, see, we find Jeremiah. Okay? This is when we find uh, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is here, and, and uh, he knows. He is a, he's a believing, he's a prophecy-believing guy. And he sees, he listens to Jeremiah, the prophet, Somebody that the rest of the people of Israel kind of hate him. They beat him up, and they, you know how the struggles of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, poor guy. I mean, it's one of the, 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 the saddest prophets there, the crying prophet. And, and, and you see Habakkuk come, and, and, and Jeremiah says, you will be taken into exile. You're going to be taken prisoners. You're going to be taken out of the promised land. And for the Israelites, the, the promised land was this sense of God's kingdom here on, here on earth. If you ever hear the phrase God's kingdom, of, you hear Jesus talk about kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, think of this. The people of God, in the place of God, with God himself in there, with the presence of God. That is what the kingdom of God is. And, 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 and that is why uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of that, and we will see the ultimate fulfillment of the second coming. Jesus, when he came on earth incarnate, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, uh, John the Baptist was able to say, and, and Jesus, the kingdom is at hand. It's, it's, it's right here. Um, and so for them, the kingdom it was so special, and the place is so special. That is why you see troubles even till this day in the Middle East, in Palestine, because the place is so important. And so Jeremiah says, you're going to be taken exile. And our brother Habakkuk, he's thinking, hold on. What is, he, what is this prophet saying? He believes it. He doesn't doubt the prophecy. He knows this is true. But he says, what in the world? This isn't right. Listen to a little bit of his complaints. Look, go in chapter 1, verse 1. If you could read that aloud with me, all right? The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. The burden. The burden. This is like a message. This is, he's, he has the message. And he says, he starts crying to the Lord. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry? And, and, and you will not hear? 
Even I cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show the iniquity and, and, and cause me to see trouble for plundering and violence are before me? There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Oh, Lord, why is there so much corruption? Lord, and, and I know you felt this way. I know you, it's, it's some, of, some of the young people here have probably at some point felt like that girl that I talked to. You know? She eats all those carbs, she eats all that sugar, and she looks great, and, she, and I'm a vegetarian, I'm a vegan. I'm, and and you, I'm following God's you know, purpose for my life. And this can happen to me. I, I've, I've, I've been there too. I grew up in a, in, in a church where I was probably one of two, three young people in, in, in the church. There wasn't a lot of young people. I, lived, I grew up in the Galapagos Islands. And it was, it was really hard because the rest of the people were just moving around with the crazy tourists who came to party. And I came with, with a Darwinistic mind. They wanted to see evolution happen, the results of evolution, supposedly. And so for, for, for me, I remember walking. You know, for, Hispanic, for the Hispanic church is really, uh, you know what the Sociedad de Jóvenes is, the AY. We have this program where it's, it's supposed to be AY, but you, you, you see all, all people coming to this program in the afternoon, Sabbath afternoon. And I remember walking from my house, going to church. And I was about 16 years old. And I, I remember I, I, I was not wearing the tie that I wore in the morning because I, I didn't want to feel like an outsider. And so I would just wear jeans and T-shirt. And my dad called me that I was a, a, a half-day Sabbatarian. <laughs> you know, I... I, I I grew up in a conservative home, and so, and I, I, and I remember walking, and I would meet up with my friends who were walking to the same um, downtown, and funny enough, right next to the Adventist church, it is in the Galapagos Islands, in uh, Santa Cruz Island, there is one of the most uh, popular discotheques, nightclubs, in town. Right next, right next door. And so my friends, they would go out to the matinee, which was like the little uh, partying stuff for underage kids. And then I would just go into church. And on Monday, I would be in class in the Adventist school, where I was the only Adventist kid in my class. And they would be talking about the party and how fun it was and, and girl so-and-so was there and this is so much fun and this is so cool and oh, so sorry, you missed it, Danny. Man, you missed all the fun. Man, why can't you dance? Why can't you come with us? Just a little bit of salsa, you know, it's not so bad. And, and, and I remember feeling at some point, not envious of the dancing, not envious of the partying, because I, that, to be honest, that really never attracted me, but I, I, I miss the, the, the hanging out, I miss the friendship, and, and you know, all the, that, that's just natural for any teenager to feel that way. Or sometimes you feel that you've been, you've been a faithful tither, you, you've, you've given this, you, you know that this is God's money, and I, I love the way uh, Lori framed it. She said, we are coming here to return the t God's tithe. We're coming here to return because th that's what we do. We return from the 100% that God has given us. And, and uh, you've been faithful, and then you see that your business is not going up as much as the other guys who do all crooked business and who are, are cheating and who are doing all this kind of stuff. And you are Lord... Where are you? 
and, and you feel. Look, look at verse 13, 113. He says, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours? Why do you not pronounce judgment against these people? Why do you not come and crush them? You are the avenger. Why do you not put order in this world? And I may be touching in, 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 a, in a very superficial uh, topic here, but I know that I, 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 yes, last Sabbath I was preaching, and then later I found out that there was somebody whose wife had cancer and is struggling with the 10th sessions of chemotherapy. I know what that's like. My, my mother went through six sessions of chemotherapy, and it, 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 was, it was horrible, one of the most horrible things she's ever gone through. Praise God. It's been 20, 21 years since that, and she's alive. But some of you may not be, the Lord knows why she, he, he gave her, 20, has given her 20 more years of life. But some of you may not be experiencing that and you're wondering why them and not me? Why are they being blessed and not me? And you may come here, you hear testimonies, you come here and you, you know where I'm going with this, right? You feel, you, you, you love God, you understand, you're, you're struggling to trust God, but you say, Lord, there's so much corruption. And sometimes if you look at the, at, at the bigger spectrum, if you think of God and his rule, and you sometimes may think of the second coming of, of the bigger perspective, and you go in the news and you see, all you see is bad news. Right now there's not a ton of bad news. Right now there's some sort of hope, you know. Every candidate is it's, it's kind of trying to say, I got the right answer. I got the solution for the world, not just for this country, it's for the whole world, you know. Some are going to give you free, gonna give you free stuff. Some are going to crush everybody else while doing it. And, and, and uh, you know, it, it just, but when you think you're a Christian, you think with a Christian mind, with an Adventist mind, you know the great controversy, you know all these things, and you're like, okay, Lord, I, I'm, I'm tired of corruption. I'm tired of hearing about rape, about deaths in Chicago. I'm tired of hearing all this uh, hatred. I'm tired of selfishness. And sometimes the people that you love the most are the ones that hurt you the most. And, and, and the people that, that, that even sometimes, I, I, I've been a pastor before and I, I, I've seen quarrels in the church. I've seen all kinds of things. Church folk are, are interesting too sometimes. And, and you, you wonder, Lord, where, when are you going to clean, clean up your church? When are you going to... Finally, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil, Lord. And you are anxious for judgment. You're zealous from, for God's work. And sometimes you're ready to take that on your own hands. And that is when things start getting a little bit difficult and you start making up theology and all these kinds of things and date setting and you want to, you know, that's a scary road to go there. So the Lord answers to Hagbaka, to all these cries. And in verse, on chapter one, he tells them, yeah. I know, I know it's, it's horrible. And you know what? But why are you bringing to destroy the people of Israel? Yeah, I don't want to bring the Chaldeans. I'm going to bring the Babylonians to take over the people of God. He's like, what? No, that's exactly what I'm complaining about. <laughs> then he goes, okay, let's, let's talk about holiness, okay? You, you are pure of eyes. You, you don't tolerate evil. And then God answers. And, but, the, but there is something really interesting about what 
Habakkuk's attitude when, when God responds. He, he has a very, very interesting attitude, and that is the attitude of a Christian. Listen to chapter 2, verse 1. He says, okay, God, I have questioned you. I have asked you what is going on. Okay, some people think this might be a little bit irreverent. But I, I invite you to just take a look when you go home and, and, and you read, read uh, Psalms 13. It's this crazy psalm. He just goes, David goes insane, angry. Read uh, Psalm 73 of Asaph. And he's like, Lord, I'm envious. I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And, and so, listen to, but listen to the attitude of a true Christian, of a true believer in God's sovereignty. Habakkuk 2, verse 1. Read. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. And watch to see that he will, what he will say to me. And what will I answer when I am corrected? The difference is that our time and God's time are not measured upon the same dial. And listen to what he says. First, he says, I stand, I will stand my watch and set myself. He is determined. He has a determined and thoughtful attitude. He's like, okay, Lord, I'm here. I'm going to listen, okay, for your response. I'm going to be here, and I will, I will set. Some people lose patience, and they just leave, or they start following, little by little, departing from God's fellowship. They don't want to come to choir anymore, they don't want to come to Pathfinders anymore, it's boring, uh, they don't want to come to prayer meeting, and they're just like, oh, I'm just going to show up for service, and well, it's kind of boring, you know, eh. sermon was kind of bland. You start following God from, from afar, you start following Jesus like like Peter did after, uh, be, uh, when he denied him, you know, just kind of following him from, a, before he denied him, kind of following him from afar. Because, but, but Habakkuk instead, he, he says, I stand, and I'll set myself. And we should watch for the appearing of the Lord in fulfillment of his promise, and should be prepared to receive reproof as well as a blessing. He says, I will stand and set my watch. And he also has an attentive attitude. I will set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. I will watch and see. He's going to respond. He trusts in the promise of the Lord. He knows there's a God in heaven. He knows. He doesn't just leave. You know, and... and and this comes to us, you know, like, let me just put an example that, may, may, that I, I, I just experienced two, three years ago. I was a single pastor. Lord, where's my companion? <laughs> where's my companion? And, and you can get a little desperate when you're single. You know? And here is, you know, young adults, if you're other, if you're single, this is, at, this is the moment when you're tempted to say, well, there's this wonderful young man right here at, at my work. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's a really nice guy, you know. He's, a, he's not a believer, I mean, let alone an Adventist. You know, he's kind of, he kind of grew up Christian, but not really. And, um, you know, but he's really good. Yeah, he went on the Peace Corps some, uh, a few years ago, and he's really good. He's a nice man. He doesn't harm anybody. He's good. 
Yeah. And you're totally tempted to go on with that instead of trusting God's promises. He knows. He, and somebody told me this once, and it was such an amazing thought, and I, I, it, it brought such a blessing to my life. It was my stewardship director. When I was standing, he came to visit me in, in, in one of my churches, and he said, Danny, I know your parents, because my, my parents were pastors there as well, and, and he's like, I, kn I know your parents, and they, they have, uh, they're very interested, they're, very, they, 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 they're praying for you, they want you to su succeed, they want you to be happy, but even, and they wish, they, they, they want you to find a nice wife, a good wife, God's wife for you, but more than your parents, God has an even deeper desire to bring the right person to your life. Even more than your parents. And your parents want the best for you. So it was, he, your parents desire a blessing from you. They, just, they want the best for you. But even more than your parents, that the people that love you the most, he's got a deeper passion to bless you. Just got to wait patiently on the Lord. I could have been tempted, and, and, and I know that many young people can be tempted to just quit and leave. And then listen to his patient attitude. I will set myself on the rampart. That's like a tower, you know, like a watchman. Have you seen those people, those... Uh, those guards, the Queen's guards in London. Have you seen the videos of people teasing them? <laughs> they stand there. And when they're walking, they're on a mission. And there are anybody standing in their way. Make way for the Queen's guard. Make way. And they'll yell at you and you have to get out. And they stand there with a mission. They are waiting. They're, they're there. And this is, this is the attitude of, of Habakkuk. He's like, I, I'm, I'm not going to run anywhere. I'm, I'm just going to stay here in God's ways, patiently waiting for the Lord, because I know he will answer. I trust his promise. I will stay here. I will not run. I will stay and, and keep watch. And there's an interesting thing. It's just him. He speaks as, of a, as, as if he was a solitary man. He speaks of himself alone. And he's also very humble and submissive. He has a very humble and submissive frame of mind. Because he says, I'll watch to see what he will say to me and watch what I will answer when what? When I am corrected. Oh, that's tough. But what a, what a humble man, Habaka. What a humble man. I'm going to be corrected. I, I, I know I'm not in the right to kind of talk to God like this because I know he's got a plan. I know he's sovereign. I know. I know. I, 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 I'm a believer. I know his prophecies. I know he's coming soon. Yes. I'm an Adventist, come on, yes. I know I'm going to be corrected, but I need God's assurance. People who were in Hammond last week, I remember when John the Baptist went to ask Jesus, are you the one who's coming or should we wait for another one? John the Baptist went to the right person. He wasn't going to go anywhere. He waited there patiently on his cell, on that dungeon, just waiting. But he went to the right person. Lord, I'm here. I, I, you, he just needed a little bit of assurance, and Jesus brought him back to the Word of God. And the same thing happens to Habakkuk. He says... The Lord answered to me and said, 
write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. This prophecy, this promise, the vision is for an appointed time. At the end, it will speak. It is, the vision is due in its right time. It is God timing. You and, I, you and I are mere human being, sinners, falling short of the glory of God. Don't, st- don't pretend that at some point we will stand above God's sovereignty, God's rule, and say, Lord, I'm going to bring about justice. I'm going to clean up your church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you come for me. What a pretentious attitude. Each promise in the end will prove true. At the end, it shall speak. Each promise repay our waiting. Though it tarry, wait for it. Each promise will be punctual. Isn't that kind of contradictory? Though it tarries, it will not tarry. Though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not tarry. It may appear to delay but it will come. It will come. Friends, you will be tempted to run impatient. And impatience comes from pride, which is the opposite of faith. Listen to verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. This theme of living by faith, the Apostle Paul, as the writer of Hebrews, took it. Hebrews 10, and, 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 he, and, and Paul make it its own. And it's like, by faith, yes. Righteousness by faith, this is it. The just shall live by faith. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. This is how the gospel is revealed, says Romans 1, 17. This is how it, this is, how it is. This is the, the, the life. The, 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 the life that the Christian life starts, begins by faith in Christ. It is also the way it is maintained. And faith is what will bring us at last in triumph through the gates of glory into the very presence of the Lord himself. By faith, ask God for the gift of faith. That is not of yourself, not of your own. It's a miracle that you are here believing. If you're proud, you will show impatience. And impatience will lead you to sin against your God. Impatience will lead you to forsake God's holy law, God's holy principles. It will lead you to forsake that law that has been written in your, in, in, in your, in your hearts. And it will, it will make you get that desperation. It will make you do foolish things because you are not remaining. You don't have the joy on the, of the Lord in you. Friends, the world doesn't need us to be emotional or just this sort of cheerful sort of people all the time. Paul talked about this saying, we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, having nothing, yet possessing all things. And I read this this last week and it came to me it was an, an amazing quote I thought and then I looked it up in English cuando no tenemos nada más que Dios descubrimos que Dios es suficiente 
when we have nothing left but God, we become aware that God is enough. We discover that God is enough. He's more than enough for you and me. He will come soon. He has said it. He has promised it. This brings us to a mission. This brings us to live our lives in total dedication and service to Him in everything we do, in our families, in our relationships, and in our mission as a church, as kids, as, as, as children, as, as young people, as, as, as parents. And I pray that that our lasting, stable happiness, that it is Christ bought, Christ wrought, we will be able to live it, this joyful Christian life in the midst of this crazy, wretched, sinful, selfish world. Friends, may God bless you and guide you as you live the joyful life of a Christian and with him may people know that you've been through the struggles and you are so, you've been you're a sorrowful person and you know that Jesus what a man of sorrows acquainted with grief Baron de Dolores acquainted with grief but at the same time I think what Jesus was the happiest man that ever lived and may we be able to say the last, with, with Habakkuk, the last three verses of Habakkuk is a hymn of faith. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit on the vines, though the labor of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet, yet, even though there's not all those things, yet, I will rejoice. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength and he will keep, make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk like I'm on the mountaintop, like I'm on the king of the world. Friends, may you be able to say that prayer today. That in the struggles, in the waiting of the, the second coming of the Lord, you will trust him because the righteous shall live by faith.